Good morning, everyone. This is Maurice Stroman, the Associate Executive Director of the Middle Atlantic Conference. Um, if you're on this conference call right now, this is the Student Athlete Advisory Committee orientation call. So thank you for being on this call. Um, right now, I am going to mute everyone's line. Um, but if you do have any questions throughout our call today, you can unmute your line by hitting star six. Um, so feel free to ask a question if something comes up, but we will have time for questions at the end as well. All right, so to start out, um, we're going to skip all the way down to slide three. There is a video here that was produced by the NCAA a few years ago, um, and it talks about the NCAA generally and the role of SAC. So what I'd like you to do right now, it's about a four-minute video. I want you to go ahead and click on that and view that, and then uh, when you're done viewing that video, we will continue with the orientation calls. So what is the NCAA, and where do you fit into it as a Division III student athlete? You might be surprised to find out that your voice matters. When I first arrived on campus, I thought the NCAA was just an office that organized the championships and made the rules we had to follow. But I've learned the NCAA is three divisions of over 1,100 colleges, universities, and conferences, and 460,000 student athletes. So in reality, the NCAA is all of us, especially the student athletes. That's why it's so important that you know your voice matters. Division three is the largest of the three NCAA divisions with 450 schools and 183,000 student athletes. It's the mission of Division three to have an environment where athletics are an integral part of the educational experience. So who makes decisions in Division three to help us stay in line with this philosophy? Well, the Division three governance structure is made up of several committees that create legislation, organize championships, manage the finances, and oversee all other aspects of the division. Student athlete representatives play a huge role on almost every single committee, ensuring that our voice is a part of the decision-making process. By having student athlete representation on these committees, Division Three is making it clear that your voice matters. We get it. It's easy to say your voice matters on these committees, in Division Three and the NCAA. But I'm sure you're thinking, if my voice matters, how is it heard? Well, let us show you how the flow of information works and how you can get involved. First, let's talk about the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, or SAC. SAC is a group of student athletes who come together and enhance the total experience by promoting opportunity, protecting student athlete welfare, and fostering a positive image while maintaining the tenets of the Division III philosophy. SAC exists at three different levels, campus, conference, and national. A campus SAC is meant to serve student athletes on the local level. In other words, the issues or concerns on a specific campus. During their regular meetings, campus SACs discuss issues that affect student athletes at the conference and national levels, as well as organize or assist in the planning of community service events and serve as leaders for the entire campus community. Conference SACs are typically made up of members from each school in a conference and meet around two times per year. At conference SAC meetings, student athletes can voice their opinions on potential legislation, discuss broader student athlete well-being issues affecting the conference, and organize conference community service initiatives. Finally, Division III National SAC is comprised of 22 student athletes, each representing their own conference as well as a partner conference. After collecting feedback from institutions and conferences, National SAC members represent student athletes on the floor at the NCAA convention where rules are voted on by the Division III membership. National SAC also champions other initiatives like the You Can Play Project, the It's On Us campaign, and the Division III Special Olympics Partnership. Essentially, the communication cycle goes from Campus SAC to Conference SAC to National SAC and SAC. Along with the committee's representation, this communication cycle ensures that you, as a student-athlete, have a way to voice your opinions, because as a Division III student-athlete, your voice matters. The student-athlete voice isn't just important. It is essential to the success of Division III and the NCAA. Division III student-athletes have had a voice dating back to the creation of the division, and that voice is as important as ever today. Each one of you has the potential to make a difference. Make sure your voice is heard by getting involved, whether it is with the SAC at the campus, conference, or national level, at practice with your teammates and coaches, 
in the athletics department with your administrators, in the classroom with your peers and faculty, and in the community. Congratulations on being a Division III student athlete. And remember, your voice matters. All right, so hopefully by now you've been able to watch that four minute video. Um, that video really does a good job of just giving an overview about what SAC is, and we're going to talk about some of that stuff today um, and then get into some more specifics related to the conference. So if you had to slide four, uh, our conference call agenda for today. First, we're going to review the Student Athlete Advisory Committee and the role that that committee plays. Then we'll also go into some other information about the Middle Atlantic Conference, so just an overview, um, just so you have some background information, not necessarily related to SAC specifically, but just so you have some of that information in your back pocket as a context to when um, you need your student athlete voice heard. And then finally, we're going to go over some NTA information, um, similar to what we talk about with the conference level, just some information that is good for you to know as a student athlete representative. Moving on to slide five, what is a student athlete advisory committee? Well, this committee is made up of student athletes and mainly the intent of this group is to provide insight on the student athlete experience um, and really give a student athlete voice. So this, the SAC provides input on rules, regulations, policies that affect student athletes' lives. It's important to note that there's a SAC at many different levels. So you have one on your campus level and then we also have a conference and national level SAC. At the national level, there are um, different SAC groups for each division. So Division One, Two, and Three each have their own Student Athlete Advisory Committee. And this is something that is mandated by NCA legislation. So it's not just something um, someone decided to do, do one day. It's something that's been approved at the national level. Moving on to slide six, the purpose of SAC. Again, we want to generate that student athlete voice within your institution. Also at the conference level, if there's anything from a broader student athlete experience that needs to be addressed, that's the avenue to do that. Um, then also there's proposed NCA legislation each year that as student athletes you can review and respond to. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that administrators and presidents, they really do listen to the student athletes when it comes to NCA legislation and whether or not they support or oppose legislation. So it really is a strong voice and I want you to understand that, that um, student athletes are listened to. And then finally, the purpose of SAC, we want to support the campus and conference community through community outreach efforts. One thing I think that gets skewed a little bit with the Student Athlete Advisory Committee is that that bottom bullet, um, community outreach efforts. Some people think that the committee is more community outreach based. Obviously, as student athletes on campus, you are leaders and there's nothing wrong to be called upon to organize and support community initiatives. Um, but just want to emphasize again that the main intent of this committee is to generate that student athlete voice. So slide seven, um, this is a best practices document that was put together a few years ago. And even though it is a few years old, it is really a good uh, starting point if any of you are new to your campus SAC or you feel like your campus SAC needs a little bit revamping, this document would be a good thing to take a look through. Uh, we can make that available um, on the conference SAC webpage. But uh, if you just need any ideas, you want to review some things, this is a good document to start. So slide eight, this is uh, kind of a diagram of how the student athlete voice is actually heard. Um, so you have the student, individual student athlete and hopefully they can provide feedback to the leaders on their team. And at your comp campus SAC level, you should have representatives from each individual team so that you can provide feedback to that level. And then also at the conference level, we have representatives from each campus. And then at the national SAC level, there are representatives from each partner conference. So two conferences um, actually pair up to have a representative. So. One thing uh, you really want to emphasize is that even though you are just one student athlete, you can have your experience and your voice heard at the national level. Um, so people making decisions, people voting on bylaws and legislation, they do hear your experience as an individual athlete. And maybe your experience is similar to those um, in another team or even um, 
similar sports at different institutions. So that's just kind of the, the flow of how communication and how your voice is heard. Moving on to slide nine, talking a little more about your campus DAC. Um, there's a link here. Some of the institutions have campus DAC websites. If you haven't put together a website, I would encourage you to do so. If you need help um, reaching out to your sports information director to do that, just let me know. So the composition of your campus DAC, it isn't legislated, but it is recommended that you do have at least one to two representatives from each NCA sponsored sport. And then you should also have someone from the administration or staff as an advisor to your committee. In terms of meetings, again, there isn't necessarily a regular meeting schedule for all of the campus stacks, but we just want to make sure that you have established a consistent meeting schedule so that um, both the committee members and anyone from the outside of the committee, whether that be other people on campus, um, they're able to access those meetings and really get in touch with you. Then in terms of the constitution, not every campus stack will have the same constitution, but just make sure that you create bylaws and establish a purpose for your group. That way when you do have meetings, you are really efficient at getting stuff done. Slide 10, talking a little bit more about MACSAC. So we do have a committee homepage as a part of GoMacSports.com. Uh, we do also have a Facebook group, which we use sometimes to communicate. And then we have a committee listserv. So if you need to send a message out to the entire conference SAC, just send an email to SAC at GOMACSports.com. Alternatively, if you'd also like to include SAC advisors, so the advisors from each campus, we have a listserv for that as well, which is SAC advisors at GOMACSports.com. So the composition of your committee is um, student athletes who have been selected by their athletic directors. And what we recommend from each institution is at least two student athletes. And we say at least because we do, we don't actually restrict um, participation in conference SAC. If you want to have five or six individuals from your institution participate, um, we are open to that at this point. Um, but we do say at least two student athletes. And then the composition of those two student athletes, we request at least one male and one female. Uh, from different sports. So men's and women's soccer, for example, would not be a good representation from one institution. And then we also want to have representation from upperclassmen, so a junior or a senior, and then underclassmen, freshman, sophomore, or junior. And we do that just to ensure that we have a continuous representation each year. So we don't want a completely new committee each year. We want to have people who have experience as committee um, and feel like we can get some stuff done. Then you also have the max staff liaison set assist with the committee. In terms of meetings, there are in-person meetings in September and February. And then there are conference calls in September. That's the orientation call today. And then October and April. One thing I would like to point out is that even though there may be multiple representatives from each institution as a part of the committee, um, when it comes to voting on action items, there is only one vote per institution. Um, so during the meetings or on conference calls, you'll have to decide who that representative will be to, to make that vote for your institution. So slide 11, talking about responsibilities being a part of MACSAC. Uh, you need to be an active participant in all of your campus and conference SAC meetings. So as much as you can, get those dates in your calendars. Um, if you have conflicts, try to find ways that you can still participate. Um, we do have those dates uh, later on here in the next slide. So want to make sure that we get those in your calendar. You also need to have an open line of communication um, with our staff and then work as a liaison between your institution or campus SAC and the conference SAC. Another responsibility of yours is to be aware of issues and updates from both the conference and the NCA, which could affect student athletes. So if there's something from our meeting that you want to update your campus about, um, or even at the national level, you'll be responsible for reporting back to student athletes on your campus. Slide 12, talking more about the, our meeting format um, on here is the date for this year um, with those two in-person meetings and three conference calls. The meetings are all scheduled to start at 11 a.m. Um, and our in-person meetings will conclude by 2 p.m. and conference calls should be about an hour and end around noon. Um, I will say something new this year is that the meeting schedule was changed to Sundays instead of Fridays. Um, and that was something that was encouraged by your executive committee after getting some feedback about 
uh, missed class time and just trying to see if we can get a more consistent uh, representation from each institution and see if maybe we can get more representatives at meetings. Um, so I understand some of you may have conflicts on Sundays, um, but just like there were conflicts on Fridays, we just wanted to shift, see if maybe this change would help the committee at all. Slide 13, I want to talk just briefly about Robert's Rules of Order. Um, this is kind of the way you go about running a meeting. Um, for any of you who have served on committees on your campus um, or have been a part of other kind of business meetings, this is just kind of the general way to make sure that the meeting runs smoothly and accurately. So it is the responsibility of the chair to run the meeting. Um, and just a, a few things I'd like to point out that are important for our meeting. So nothing goes to discussion without a motion being on the floor. So when I say a motion, um, that means someone from the committee has to um, make a motion to discuss something and then that motion needs to be seconded. Um, it can't just be something that one person wants to talk about for the whole committee to discuss that we need to have at least two parties. Um, and then when you want to discuss that motion after it's been placed on the floor, um, then you just need to make sure you raise your hand and the chair will kind of coordinate that discussion with the committee. Slide 14 and talk a little bit more about Robert's Rules of Order. So how exactly do you bring about a motion? Um, so simply raise your hand and say, I move that whatever motion you want to make. So just an, as an example, um, you could say, I, I move that our meeting start at 12 noon instead of 11 a.m. So to second that motion, we just need someone else from a different institution to either to say I second the motion or I second or second. And that's just something that can be verbally explained. It doesn't need to be pointed out by the chair. Um, so then the chair will state the motion and then you can actually have a discussion about that item. So slide 15, then once the discussion has kind of ended and the chair um, realizes that there aren't really any more topics to discuss when it comes to that motion, then we put that motion to a vote. Um, so the chair can ask if everyone feels like they feel the discussion has concluded um, and if you're ready to vote. So at that point, there are a couple ways that you can take a vote. Um, if it's something that you think is non-controversial, you can do a voice vote. Um, so at that time, the chair will say all those in favor say aye, and all those opposed say nay. Um, and then you can also abstain from a motion as well. So if you just don't feel like you have enough information, um, you don't want to make a vote at that time, you can abstain. Um, if there is some kind of topic that may be more controversial, you may make a hand vote. So the chair may just ask for you to raise your hand for whichever uh, position you vote for. Um, let's see, slide 16. Once the vote has been concluded, then the chair will announce the result of the vote. Um, and just so you know, abstentions are not counted in a vote. So for example, if there are 10 voting members and um, let's say four abstain, and then we have three in support and three opposed, um, technically that motion would not pass because the majority um, did not um, vote in the prevailing side. So we only had three voting in the prevailing side. So um, if you have any questions about Robert, Robert's Rules of Orders, I, I brushed through that pretty quickly. Um, but we will try to make sure that our meetings follow Robert's Rules of Order, um, but we won't hold them too, too, too strongly. But we just want to make sure our meetings run smoothly. So slide 17, uh, I want to put some faces in front of you uh, for your leadership. So you have the MACPAC Executive Committee, which was elected this past spring. Uh, so your president is Will Cameron from King's College. Vice President of Communications is Katie Goldsmith from Lebanon Valley College. Vice President is JT Klopstick from Stevenson University. Sorry, he's the Vice President of Student Athlete Wellness. And then Vice President of Community Involvement is Brooke Yorger from Albright College. Slide 18, we have some more leadership for you to see. Um, Ken Andrews is the Executive Director of the conference. And then myself, we will participate in all of your meetings with you. Then we also have Maddie Burns, who is our National SAC representative. Um, so she's a student athlete from Randolph-Macon College, and she's representing both the MAC and the Old Dominion Athletic Conference. 
And then we will have an associate representative on that committee since Maddie is not in our conference. Um, we have the opportunity to provide a, an associate representative. Um, that representative will be nominated by the conference office and, and that's to be determined at this point. Um, but just so you know, that is a new position. So in the future, when Maddie rolls off the national SAC, we will actually have a national SAC representative and then the ODAC will have an associate representative. Now, the role of that individual um, is to participate, I think, in um, there's a summer meeting at the NCAA national office and then participating in the meeting at the NCAA national convention and then also participating in other teleconferences. If, um, if there is a situation where Maddie cannot participate in the national SAC meetings, our associate representative from the conference would then take her place at those meetings. All right, so that's a good segue to slide 19, talking about NCAA Division III SAC. The composition of that committee is 20 student athletes, and the composition for them is 50% male, 50% female, so that's controlled by a nominating committee that the NCAA has. And then they also have a 25% um, ratio of ethnic minority representation. Each of the student athletes represents two conferences, like I said, the MAC and the ODAC. Also on that committee, there are two management council ex officio representatives, so kind of like our staff liaisons at the conference level. Um, those are individuals that help the committee um, bridge the gap between student athletes and administrators. And then also uh, that committee has NCA staff members that act as liaisons. The Division Three SAC, they have in-person meetings in July, November, January, and April, and then they also have conference calls throughout the year as necessary. All right, so we're going to shift gears now talking about SAC and move into talking about the conference. Um, so these are pictures actually of our offices in Anvil. Um, we have our offices in like an office suite. Um, so when you're talking about the conference, um, you can talk about the conference office, so staff. We have three full-time staff. Um, but if you're also talking about the conference, you could be talking about the membership. So that's all 17 member institutions and the committees um, that work within that conference. So what exactly do we do at the conference level? Well, obviously our main um, role is to administer championships uh, for the 27 sports that we sponsor. And we also act as the governing body of the conference. So at the conference level, in terms of the office staff, we're not necessarily the ones making decisions for the membership, but more so um, being the one to implement all the legislation and bylaws that the members have agreed to. I do also want to point out that the conference is a nonprofit 501c3. Uh, so we are a nonprofit organization. We do not um, conduct ourselves to make money. We are more so, uh, you could view us as an educational organization, um, providing that educational experience for you as a student athlete. And then finally, where our offices are in Anvil, Pennsylvania, just down the street from Lebanon Valley College. Slide 21, talking about the MAC governance structure. Um, so again, I talked about our office staff. Um, in charge or in lead of the conference is all the conference president, and they have an executive board of four members that leads that group. We also have the athletic directors and an athletic directors board, which consists of three athletic directors that leads that subgroup. And then we also have committees. So there's a committee of athletic trainers, faculty athletic representatives. Each sport has a committee, so all of your head coaches are part of those committees. Sports information, and then finally, student athletes. And you have an executive committee as well that leads your group. Slide 22, uh, the MAC Factbook. This is the document that includes all of our bylaws and rules. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating that you go read through the MAC Factbook at this point. Um, but if you ever have any questions about uh, where the rules come from, this is um, the document that pretty much governs the conference. It includes all of these um, different topics that you see listed on this slide. So slide 23, I want to talk a little bit about the MAC budget. Um, again, I said we were a nonprofit organization. So we do have revenues of roughly half a million dollars each year. and that money comes mostly from membership dues, so 60% of that is your institution just providing a check to the conference. Uh, we also receive money from the NCA through grants. That's about 20% of our budget. 
And then the remaining 20% we do make from ticket sales, merchandise sales, and other, other sources. In terms of our operating expenses, then we do spend all of our revenues each year. A big chunk of that goes towards salary and benefits of our full-time staff, so it's 45%. But 20% of that goes straight back to championships, so um, the cost of facilities, uh, paying for officials, those kinds of fees. Um, special programming is another 20%. So special programming includes um, programming with your committee, um, special events, special initiatives, awards, branding, those types of things. 10% goes towards supplies, so use of our phone and internet technology, um, the rental of our office space, and then some other professional expenses rounds out with 5%. So that's um, like legal and accounting, um, travel, other membership dues that we are a part of. Slide 24, um, talk a little bit more about our budget and specifically how it relates to you. Um, so previously you may have remembered that from the conference office we would provide $500 to each institution for your, for your campus stack. Um, but we're under a little bit different financial model this year. So each institution will be provided up to $2,000 this year for special programs. And those programs can address student athlete well-being, community service, equity and inclusion, sportsmanship, or identity and integration activities. Um, so that $500 didn't necessarily go away. It's now a part of that $2,000. And the decision maker for how that money is spent is your athletic director. So if you have a program this year, that you want to see happen, or if you need some funding for your campus stack, your athletic director is the person to reach out to at this point. So slide 25, um, gomaxsports.com. This is the website for the conference. Um, a lot of information is here um, related to, I'm sure what you like to look at is um, championships information or playoffs or standings information, that's all here. Um, but also some membership resources and other information about our awards, that's all on our website. Talking about the MAC championship structure on slide 26, this is something I think that's um, most confusing for people outside the conference. So currently we operate under an umbrella structure, the Middle Atlanta Conference and then other two conferences, MAC Commonwealth and MAC Freedom. So the Middle Atlanta Conference is mostly for individual sports in general and for the sports that usually qualify for postseason through a regional competition. So for example, um, cross country or wrestling. When we get into the MAC Commonwealth and MAC Freedom, that's usually for team sports and for the sports that qualify for the postseason through a conference championship, through an automatic qualifier. So the NCAA, to receive an automatic quali qualifier from them, you need a minimum of seven schools. And because we have sports like um, basketball with sponsorship across the entire 17 member institutions, we're able then to split the conference up into MAC Commonwealth and MAC Freedom and get an automatic qualifier for each of those conferences. So instead of one big conference of 17 receiving one AQ for the NCAA championship, we're able to secure two, which is something unique to our conference. So slides 27 and 28, those just list the sports that are under that championship structure. So 27 lists all of the Middle Atlantic Conference sports. Um, and you'll see that a couple of these are a little bit different. So exam for example, football is an AQ sport, but because we don't have enough member institutions sponsoring that to get to at least 17 conferences, that is something that's just one conference. Um, same thing with women's golf. For men's and women's ice hockey, that is a sport that we sponsor. Um, and we do name a champion based on regular season competition, but currently we don't have the minimum 17 requirement to get that AQ, so they actually get an AQ from another um, conference affiliation. So slide 29, we're going to transition now to talk about the NCA. Um, again, when you're talking about who the NCA is, there's two different sides to that. You could be talking about the staff that actually works at the national office, which is pictured here. Or you could be talking about the membership. So the um, at the Division three level, I believe there's about 450 member institutions. Um, but then the membership also includes Division one and Division two institutions. And the same as the conference level, um, the NCA also has different committees that serve the national organization. The, what they do in terms of an organization, 
Um, they administer championships just like we do at the conference level, and they act as a governing body for the national organization. Where their office is located is in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, and actually pretty interesting that their headquarters are right next to the National Federation of High Schools. Slide 30 um, is an infographic that you may recall was in the video that we watched at the beginning. This is just kind of an infographic about how the governance structure works at the NCAA level. So the key thing I want to point out here, you don't have to memorize any of this, um, but the key thing I want you to know is that the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, um, which is listed the second to the right, is a part of that governance structure. So as student athletes, your voice is intentionally put in that structure so that you can um, adequately um, help the national governing body. So slide 31, talk about the NCA budget. Um, this is something I think that gets skewed a lot, especially in the media. So just want you to have some of this information to so understand kind of how it all works. Their revenues are roughly $950 million each year. And a majority of that, you'll see 90% comes from television and marketing rights. And that mostly comes from the Final Four men's basketball tournament. There are also other sources of revenue from ticket sales. And then also, as an NCA member, you do pay member dues. So each school and each conference does pay dues to the NCA. In terms of operating expenses, 96% of um, their revenues are distributed, or excuse me, their expenses are distributed through services and direct distribution so that they go directly back to the schools um, in various different ways. At the Division III level, from those operating expenses, we receive 3.18%, which is an estimated just over $30 million each year. Out of that chunk of money, about 74% of that, or almost $24 million, is spent on championships. So if you've participated in an NCAA championship before, the NCA provides uh, funding for your travel, um, for the facilities, for officials, um, all the signage, basically everything related to NCA championships that's funded through that $24 million. And then the other 26% or almost $8 million is spent on grants and programming. Slide 32, uh, I want to talk about the NCA website. So the first one here is NCA.org. So this is more driven towards um, membership and um, different committees and that kind of information. If you go to slide 33, that's NCA.com. This site is geared more towards um, NCA championships and scores um, and just getting updates from general NCA contests. Slide 34 is a picture of the NCA manual. So this specifically is a picture of the Division Three manual. This is a, a book <laughs> that lists the Constitution and the operating bylaws uh, for the division. Um, again, I'm not advocating that you go ahead and read this, but there is a lot of um, information in there that if you are interested in how um, the NCA runs or why there are specific rules, um, this is a document that kind of explains that all. So slide 35, uh, something that's important for you to be aware of as student athletes is the NCA legislative calendar, because we do ask for your input as a part of the legislative cycle. So July 15th, so earlier this summer, was the deadline to um, submit any proposed legislation. Um, in terms of submitting proposals, they can come from either two conferences or I think it's 20 member, individual member institutions. Um, then around August 15th, the IPOPL or the initial publication of proposed legislation is published. So that's kind of a document that outlines all of the proposals that have been put forth. Um, some of them may have been put forth by a conference that wants another conference to co-sponsor it. So this is kind of a first go ahead of um, proposed legislation that the, the NCA is thinking about. So then after the September 1 deadline to get co-sponsorship for proposed legislation, we're going to see the SIPOPL or the second publication of proposed legislation published on September 23rd. Um, you may notice that that's also the date of your first in-person meeting. So hopefully we'll have that document for your meeting, and it would be really great if we can take a look through that. Um, but the SIPOPL is basically that finalized listing of, okay, these are the pieces of legislation we're going to talk about. So then on November 15th, that's the official notice. Um, that's all of the proposals um, and the format for voting on them. That is released to the members. 
So then, January 26th of this year at the NCA National Convention, the membership will vote on the legislation, and usually August 1 of the next year is when legislation will take effect. At this time, I think I've gone through most of the content um, that we needed to today. If anyone has any questions at this point, you can go ahead and unmute your line if you hit star six. Um, you can ask any questions about anything we've talked about today, or if you have questions about anything else, um, that maybe we didn't address that you thought that maybe we would. I'm going to open the floor at this time. So go ahead. If you have any questions, go ahead and hit star six. Um, introduce yourself and ask us your question. Hey, it's JT. Um, I'm just wondering what piece of legislation came out of the IPOPL a few weeks ago. One proposal talking about establishing an acclimatization period for field hockey and soccer. So some of you may recall that preseason for football has changed a little bit with the elimination of two-a-days. Um, and you may have realized in the past that football has a five-day acclimatization period um, where they get used to the heat and being outdoors. So that's something that's being talked about for field hockey and soccer. Hi, Marie. This is Brooke Good from Messiah College. Um, just had a quick hi, question. Brooke. Where is, hi, where is um, the first face-to-face max sac meeting being held yep so the meeting on september 23rd will be at the sale and then that second in-person meeting which is february 10th that will also be at the sales university and, and it'll be in the same room that we've been in the past i believe it's called the commonwealth room in the university center great thank you mm -hmm. if you do have a question that pops up um, maybe later today or in a couple of days, you can feel free to um, email me or call me or text me. My number is on my email signature. Um, but we will have a meeting in just a couple of weeks. I'm excited to meet all of you. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for being on the call today. I know Sunday is a busy homework day for many. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time to go through this orientation call and get ready for the year. Thanks, everyone.